Li Yun Xiao, the Peak Nine Heavens Marshal Sovereign Hu Fei Yang reincarnated, gathers great forces to help the second prince, Qin Yue, in his ascension to the throne. Even powerful martial kings rally behind the boy. Yun Xiao then puts together an extraordinary army to deal with the Hundred Battles country, making them reach greater heights with his guidance. Now, he faces off against Li Yi and the Golden Lion Army, giving them a taste of his true strength. The winds and clouds rise all because of Yun Xiao, forming a gigantic palm in the sky. With the reincarnated soul's signal, the heavens erupt, and the enormous hand slams down onto the demonized Li Yi. Getting blasted by the great wind and cloud palm, the ape screams out in frustration. At the same time, Yuan Jia feels something tugging at him. Regardless, the massive hand of the heavens smashes into the ground, sending shockwaves far and wide. While the entire battlefield braces itself for impact, Ji Meng notices Yun Shi Yao flying through the air from his own attack's recoil and rushes to save him, asking the boy if he's okay. Shi Yao Ching Wang, Shan Da Sheng, and Lu Yun Shang come running to his location. Being supported by Ji Meng, Yun Shi Yao announces that he will be fine if teacher Lu hugs him. Getting all flustered by the boy's dirty words, Yun Shang turns away. Da Sheng laughs noting that Yun Xiao must really be alright, if he is still flirting with a woman in his state. Blood got that wounded Riz. In a split second, the Commander-in-Chief's entire demeanor changes, as he turns over to make the Golden Lion Army pay. Meanwhile, Jia Lan Academy's student army gathers over the crater, formed by Yun Xiao's great wind and cloud palm, wanting to confirm Li Yi's corpse. However, despite the fact that they saw him getting hit with the attack with their own eyes, the ape is nowhere to be found. Instead, Yuan Jia's bloodied corpse lies buried in the earth. Not having seen Li Yi escape, even Kong Li Chun is left questioning how he managed to do so. This dude got more plot armor than the protagonist. Of course, the martial lord has better things to worry about at the moment, as Qing Wang, Da Sheng, and Yun Shan march towards him. The Golden Lion army is in the same deep trouble as they get confronted by the student soldiers, brimming with killing intent. Yu Xiao gets up with Ji Ya Rong's help, getting asked how they should deal with the enemies now. Boasting about his status as the general of the Golden Lion Army, who is just doing his task, Kong Li Chun questions whose authority they are punishing him on. He hopes to come up with a logical excuse, praying that his high military rank saves him. Hearing this, Yu Xiao orders Ji Mun to tell him whose authority it is. The latter charges forward, landing a thunderous gut punch on Kong Li Chun. As the general goes flying, Ji Meng leaps after him to knee him right in the stomach. A barrage of fists follows, making Kong Li Chun beg Ji Meng to stop hitting him. Of course, he only does so when Yun Shi Yao tells him to. Towering over the bloodied general, the boy confirms that he finally knows whose authority it is now. Seeing Kong Li Chun begging the enemy for mercy, the Golden Lion army shakes in fear. At the same time, Yun Shi Yao asks the decades old general how he even became a martial lord considering he still doesn't understand the concept of letting his fists do the talking. The boy announces that the general will at least die understanding it. Hearing this, Kong Li Chun protests wildly, questioning who Yun Xiao is to ignore the imperial law. The reincarnated soul declares that law and teachings are worth nothing to him, but almost making him lose his life is a crime worth death. Spit, my king, begging for mercy. The martial lord of the Four Quadrants realm vows to finally pledge his loyalty to Yun Xiao, if his life is spared. Acknowledging Kong Li Chun's worth as a martial lord, Da Sheng notes that having him by their side would help them greatly. However, Yun Xiao simply snarks. After all, on the path of martial arts, a martial lord hasn't even scratched the surface. These words leave Qing Wang, Yun Shang, and Da Sheng all in disbelief. Devoid of all remorse, Yun Xiao shouts out, Execute. With this, Ji Meng coldly beheads Kong Li Chun. Declaring that Kong Li Chun deserved to die a thousand times over for his crimes, Chun Da Sheng warns the Golden Lion Army's vice commanders that they are up next. Huang Hong and Hua Man, the army's two vice commanders, come forward to greet Da Sheng. For Kong Li Chun's sin of conspiring with the enemy, he will now officially change the Golden Lion Army's lineup. The Commander-in-Chief inquires if there are any objections, and both Vice Commanders vow to not object to his will. With this, Da Sheng assigns Huang Hong as the Golden Lion Army's commander, giving them a chance to atone for their past mistakes by returning to the front lines. 
Loud chants erupt as the former deserters take an oath to protect their homeland. Meanwhile, in Mu Li'an Tian's residence, the greedy city lord paces about, worrying if Kong Li Chun can get his wealth back. Wu Guang tells his father not to fret, as the Golden Lion Army's general is a great martial lord. However, this reassurance gets him smacked away, as Wu Li'an wasn't asking him. But Bon Bing Bai. The commander thinks that getting it back won't be a problem. Though making Kong Li Chun spit out all the recovered wealth would be impossible. Of course, it's still better than losing all of it. Impeccable argument, sire. As Wu Li'an Tian imagines furiously tearing the brats apart piece by piece, a guard informs him that the Golden Lion Army has returned with them. However, before the guard finishes his briefing, Wu Li'an Tian and Wu Guang rush out. The city lord tells Commander Bond to come with him, to welcome the army back hoping to break every single bone in the thieves' bodies, only to hear Yun Xiao declare that there's no need for that. Slashing up the piggy father Sun Duo, the reincarnated soul, puts Bon Bing Bai in charge of Sunshore City's administrative matters for now. With a discerning gaze, the former warns the latter not to disappoint him. Sometime later, inside the Central Army's main commander's tent, Chum Lin questions Yun Xiao's recent feats and wonders if he's still human. After all, the blue-black killing that was coming from the student army, Chun Lin had only ever seen crazed serial killers emit before. As he deems the student soldiers to be gods of killing, Da Xiang informs him of an ancient legend. If a battlefield gets too bloody and cruel, the god of killing will descend on it. Engulfed in a blue-black chi and covered in scales, no one would dare to look him in the eye. Another more ancient name for this blue-black killing intent is Ramayana, the power to kill everything. As killing intent is also a form of power besides martial arts, Da Sheng concludes that there must be masters who specialize in this field. Han Qian Fang questions how Yun Xiao not only managed to learn such a rare cultivation technique, but also passed it to 2,000 people. Xiao Cheng Wang remarks that an expert is helping the boy behind the scenes, willing to bet his life that a 15 year old is accomplished and strong as him. Doesn't have a teacher. Dumb ways to die. Da Sham agrees, noting that the person backing Yun Xiao has to be a pretty significant figure. Remembering the reincarnated soul's earlier words, Ching Wang believes that his teacher must be someone much stronger than him. The commander then asks Yun Shang if he has any knowledge of this matter. After all, the technique Li Yun Xiao used against Li Yi was Gu Fei Yang's great wind and cloud palm. According to rumors, the former ninth tier refiner had five disciples in total. Hu a Qian Shu, the eldest disciple, became a martial sovereign a few years ago, and currently resides in the holy city of Snowguard. On the other hand, there has been no news of the second disciple, Mo Xiao Chuan, in the past decade. The third disciple, Jun Ruyun, is affiliated with one of the three great empires, the Gu Wu Empire. Hao Lian Xiao Huan, the fourth disciple, has been fighting for the position of mercenary king. Against the Blazing Fire mercenary group's leader, bearing no results. Lastly, the one that they are most familiar with, and the fifth disciple, Yang Di. Some say that he has already become a seventh tier emperor refiner, and has made his way to the deity transformation sea. Chun Da Sheng, Chun Lin, Xi Yao Qing Wang, and Han Qian Fang all take turns talking about who out of the five disciples might be teaching Yun Xi Yao. Through the process of elimination, they agree that the most plausible one is the legendary martial sovereign, Hua Qian Shu. Thinking it to be a shocking scenario, they turn to Luo Yun Shang for her opinion. After all, she is the one who understands Gu Fei Yan the most out of all of them. As Yun Shang questions why Yun Xiao's teacher has to be among Gu Fei Yang's five disciples, Han Qian Fang wonders if anyone besides them would know the great wind and cloud palm technique. Pushing her hair back behind her ear, the lady expresses certainty in the fact that Yu Xiao didn't learn the move from any of the five disciples. Ching Wan hesitates to even think of the implication, but Yu Shang ecstatically declares that his teacher is Gu Fei Yang himself. So close, yet so far. Chun Lin shouts out in disbelief while Da Sheng declares Yu Shang's theory to be impossible. After all, everyone knows that Gu Fei Yang died in the Tiandan Mountains 15 years ago. With tears flowing down her eyes, she remarks that no one is mighty enough to kill him. Thinking that the martial sovereign must have only suffered major injuries, teacher Lu concludes that he became Li Yun Xiao's teacher by pure chance. Her confident gut feeling puts the men in thought, making them ponder 
if anyone else besides Gu Fei Yang could even pass down his specific mannerisms. Shi Yao Ching Wang questions, if Yu Shang is really saying that the legendary military breaker is currently in hiding, worrying about the implications of her hypothesis. If anyone powerful enough to injure the legendary martial sovereign were to catch wind of this, not only Tian Shui, but the whole of Dusk Flame Empire would get destroyed. Announcing that this topic ends now, Da Sheng tells everyone they're not to discuss it any further. Yu Shang also vows to destroy whoever dares to leak their conversation personally, getting assured that everyone there is her ally. Right then, one of the troops reports that they will be arriving at Goodwater City soon, asking if they should pass through or go around it. As the city lord, Zhuo Hong Guang, works for the eldest prince, Da Sheng orders the army to take a detour around the city. Ji Meng tells him to hold on, revealing that Yun Xiao wishes to let the army rest, and wants the student army to go ask for some supplies in Goodwater City. This confuses the general, making him wonder how they have exhausted their supplies so soon. Ji Meng then lets him know the true reason, mimicking his mischievous young master Yun masterfully to get the point across. Someone give this man an Oscar. Enraged, Chum Lin announces that they aren't a bunch of robbers, getting calmed down by Da Sheng. After all, dealing a blow to the opposition during the fight, for the throne is bound to benefit them. The general gives Ji Meng a small time frame to carry out their mission, getting assured that they will be done. Before that, Chum Lin can't help but feel that Da Sheng is treating Yu Xiao a little too well, considering no one previously would have even dared to do something so unlawful. Meanwhile, in Goodwater City, Zhuo Hong Guang is holding a ceremony to accept his 27th concubine. How can Bro even handle all that? Suddenly, he gets informed about a massive army's appearance outside. As the city lord wonders if it's just a general coming to congratulate them, Ji Meng announces the arrival of the East Advancing Army. He insists that Hong Guang continues with his day as usual, while they help themselves with their supplies. With this, the student army starts ravaging the place. The city lord tries to get his troops to fight back, only to have his residence cut in half in the process, making Hong Guang wet his pants. Ji Meng marches off, declaring that this attack was for the eldest prince. He arrives back at the commander's carriage, informing Da Sheng that they can start moving again. The latter inquires how much wealth the former managed to obtain, guessing that he acquired at least a million gold coins. Ji Meng reveals that it wasn't even a tenth of what they got from Sunshore City, shocking Da Sheng having been unaware of the fact that they robbed another city before this. Not only that, but the amount of wealth they retrieved from Sunshore City was about one or two hundred million gold coins worth. Hearing this, Chen Lin, Han Qian Fang, and Da Sheng lose their minds. Ji Meng then heads off to report to his young master Yun, leaving behind the three depressed men. After he leaves, Chen Lin, who has never seen so many gold coins in his life, Despite being a commander for many years, complains to his father in tears. Hun Qian Fang agrees, prompting Da Sheng to furiously turn around. Not wanting to be blamed for what happens next, he observes the army's course, checking to see the number of lands owned by the eldest prince in their path. Only finding five, Da Sheng deems them to be not enough. Blinded by greed, the general declares that they will take a longer route to rob three more cities, thinking that Li Chang Fang won't mind the extra two days. Dude's about to be richy rich at this rate. Looting all of the eldest prince's cities in their path, the central army joyfully marches onwards. Soon, news reaches Qin Yang, leaving him infuriated. After all, in just a few days, he has lost all his power that he spent years accumulating. Gao Feng notes that Li Yi was right all along, as their downfall began ever since, Li Yu and Xiao sided with Qin Yue. Seeing Qin Yang lose his mind, the martial lord tells him to calm down. Gao Feng urges the eldest prince not to forget about their trump card, reminding him that they will be fine even if the entire world is against them. Entrusting his hopes and dreams to his biggest and only trump card, Qin Yang vows to finish off all those who dare oppose him. Eight days later, the central army arrives at the insignificant Eternal Peace Sea, getting welcomed by the city lord, Yuan Zijin. Despite greeting them quite warmly, the city lord actually only wishes to avoid responsibility when the Hundred Battles country comes there. Regardless, the Central Army sets up camp in the ghost town of the city. Da Sheng, Qing Wang, Yun Shang, Yuan Zijin, Chun Lin, and Hun Xian Fang begin discussing their next course of action. Soon, Yun Xiao, Ji Meng, and Ji Ya Rong arrive there, 
apologizing for being late. Suddenly, Yu Shan gets up from her seat and starts fawning all over the reincarnated soul. Keep it in your pants, sis. Thinking that Yun Xiao is Gu Fei Yang's disciple, the lady wants to devote herself to protecting and caring for him. Unaware of their prior conversation, the boy gets worried about Teacher Luo's demeanor. He starts wondering if she knows of his true identity. Considering it's something no one would believe even if he told them, seeing everyone looking at him suspiciously. Yun Xiao bursts into a sweat. He then takes his seat beside Da Sheng, making the city lord question. If someone as young as him is also a general to get treated like this. With everyone there, Yuan Zijin informs them of the current situation, worrying that the Eternal PC will be next if the Shining Gold City falls. Moreover, the three small towns ahead of them, namely Phoenix Mountain Town, Soaring Phoenix Town, and Three Suns Town, have already fallen to the Hundred Battles country. As such, Yuan Zijin has no way of knowing the exact number of enemy forces, but estimates it to be about 800,000. Da Sheng feels that there's something wrong with this entire situation. As they have been marching for about half a month now, the Hundred Battles country should have heard about it and made a move. Since they haven't done so, it could only mean that the enemy isn't afraid of Tian Shui's forces. Theorizing what he would have done if he were the enemy's general, Chum Lin concludes that the Hundred Battles country staying at a standstill just doesn't make any sense. You're just not smart enough, little bro. This prompts Da Sheng to ask Yun Xiao what he thinks about all this. The boy questions why the Hundred Battles country can't just wait for them, getting told that their numbers would overpower the enemy once they arrive at Shining Gold City. However, Yun Xiao thinks that the general is tunnel visioning on the enemy's numbers without considering their strength. He brings up the possibility of the opposing army being comprised entirely of martial warriors, a thought that Hun, Qian Fang, and Chun Lin deem impossible. Upon Qing Wang's inquiry, Yun Xiao confirms that they should take elite soldiers into account. After all, even a million strong army wouldn't stand a chance if the enemy had a martial grandmaster on their side. Of course, is only making an improbable hypothesis, since the city would have already fallen if that were the case. So, Yu Xiao concludes that the Hundred Battles country's real goal isn't to take land or cities. Hearing this, Da Sheng quickly orders a scout officer to pick out 300 elite men to investigate the Hundred Battles country's positions. The city lord gets assigned to deal with the background stuff while the rest return to their posts and wait for orders. Later, Yun Xiao heads back to his temporary residence, accompanied by Yun Shang in the house's yard. The boy feels awkward, assuring her that he will be fine from now on. As Yun Xiao asks Teacher Luo to go back, she starts playing with her hair. Since Yun Shang hasn't found a place to stay yet, she remarks that she will just stay there with him, leaving the poor guy in disbelief. Ara ara time at last. Taken aback by Yun Shang's brazen words, Yun Xiao timidly tries to explain that the house is already full. Right then, Meng Wu peeks out through the house, announcing that Teacher Luo can stay with her, since the bed in her room is quite big. Yun Xiao furiously smarks at the girl, questioning if he should squeeze in with her in her big bed too. While poor Meng Wu runs off crying, Yun Shang asks the boy if he doesn't want her there. Yun Xiao tries to pretend otherwise, making it seem like he was just afraid of the place being too shabby or someone of her stature. Heading inside, Teacher Lu will ask Yun Xiao to follow her, having something to ask him. As the two enter a bedroom, Yun Shang quickly locks the door and casts a noise cancellation seal to prevent others from eavesdropping. Thinking that the lady has guessed his secret and can no longer suppress her love for him, Yun Xiao's processor overloads. My goat's time has come. In her, she were to forcibly do the deed with him. The difference in their cultivation would make it impossible for him to resist. Not having any other choice, Yun Xiao sits down on the bed like a helpless damsel and accepts his fate. At the same time, Yun Shang removes her coat and glasses, confirming that she is mentally prepared for what's about to happen. Wanting to hurry up so his nervousness can subside, Yun Xiao starts stripping. Baffled, Teacher Luo questions what he is doing, only for the boy to take it as a complaint about him, not being proactive enough and helping her out first. Top 10 pictures taken moments before disaster. With this, Yun Shang finally loses it. Erupting with rage, she summons her axe and rains it down on Yun Xiao, who is still under the impression that this is some special game. Of course, struggling to hold off the axe from cutting his face in half, snaps the reincarnated soul back to reality. A huge impact follows, shattering the earth and slashing the entire house in half. 
declaring that Li Yun Xiao would have died today if he weren't his disciple. Yun Shang furiously grabs her coat and heads off. And so, a poor man gets beaten up because a love-struck maiden mistakes him for being his own disciple. The next few days, Li Yun Xiao focuses on cultivating. Despite the injuries he suffered at Yun Shang's hands, his body absorbed her extreme yang, turning it into a net positive. The reincarnated soul remembers Chu Hong Yan, telling him something important. The first time a woman who cultivates the Nime Yang True Qi, the treasure of the Heavenly Night Palace, does the deed with a man, she will leave a small amount of the pure qi in her partner's body. I volunteer for the job. Yun Xiao mischievously wonders who will be able to get such a great benefit from Yun Shang. All the while, this shadow trains his soul power in the Divine Realm Tablet's Monument of the World God. Admiring his body of glass, Yun Xiao thinks that it's about time he starts collecting ingredients to refine the adversity destroying pills. Right then, his godly evolution technique disappears. Yun Xiao turns around only to see the true soul phoenix flying in the sky. He wonders how the mythical creature can be within the monument of the world god, not having seen it even in his previous life. However, Yun Xiao soon comes to understand that it is only the shadow of the phoenix, as a legendary true soul could never be trapped in an artifact. As he questions the strange things that are happening, Ji Meng arrives at the door. Within the city lord's residence, the meeting room teems with an ominous energy. Arriving there, Yu Xiao inquires about the situation. Da Sheng reveals that they have lost contact with all five batches of scouts that they sent out. To make things worse, everyone in the last two batches was even equipped with cloud-piercing arrows to send a signal in case of any danger. But Yu Ne disappeared without a trace. Due to the scouts' formation, it would also have been impossible to silently wipe all of them out. In all his years, this is the first time Da Sheng has ever encountered such a situation. Bro was fighting certified bums all this time. Hearing all this, Yu Xiao worries that his previous predictions have appeared to be true. Not only has the Hundred Battles country stationed experts throughout the area, but has also set up an array encompassing the three towns, which has caused their current predicament. As the commander-in-chief questions what they should do now, a soldier comes rushing there, informing him of a strange phenomenon taking place in the sky towards the south. Having a gut feeling about what it is, Yu Xiao quickly rushes outside. Just as he thought, the sky is riddled with remnants of the true soul phoenix, Xiao Qing Wang, and Da Sheng follow after the boy, vowing to not let the Hundred Battles country get their hands on the exceptional treasure. Not wanting to delay things any further, Da Sheng decides to order an all-out attack. Qing Wang agrees, thinking that no array can trap their 800,000-strong army. Oh, you sweet summer child. Of course, Yun Xiao has seen arrays capable of trapping even 8 billion people in his lifetime. Even if the Hundred Battles country doesn't possess such a great power, Yun Xiao wants to approach the situation with caution by scouting the area first. Da Sheng gets confused, as not even the most exceptional scouts they sent previously managed to return. With a smirk on his face, Yun Xiao announces that it's time for him to go instead, only for Yun Shang to resolutely shut him down. Being interested in the treasure as well, Xiao Qing Wang offers to accompany the boy. However, Yun Xiao declares that it isn't possible. After all, the commander will become a burden without Teacher Luo's extreme Yan Qi, suppressing the benumbing Qi inside him. Instead, he wants Ji Meng to follow him. Getting her words ignored, Yun Shang angrily grabs Yun Xiao's collar, instructing him not to play hero in an all out war. In response, he secretly says something to the lady using private sound transmission. With this, Teacher Lua backs off, leaving the others curious about what just happened. Last moment. Accompanied by Ji Meng, Yu Xiao heads out, telling everyone to just wait for him to bring good news. Later, the duo arrives before soaring Phoenix Town. Ji Meng informs Yu Xiao that his universal detect was reflected, meaning that there's an array up ahead. The reincarnated soul then activates his detection demon mood technique, mapping the entire area in front. Much to his dismay, not a single person in the town is still alive. Having seen the deformed corpses of the town folk, Yun Xiao deems the situation to be more complex than he had anticipated and wants to be extra careful from now on. Meanwhile, Jia Rong cries uncontrollably at his recent lack of screen time, questioning why his young master Yun is treating him, his first slave, like this. Arriving before the town, Yun Xiao and Ji Meng find it surrounded by a powerful barrier that can't even be detected by ordinary peasants. 
However, for the two of them, walking through it proves to be an insignificant task. Entering the barrier, the duo comes across the deformed corpses of soldiers and civilians alike. Ji Meng grits his teeth at the cruelty of the Hundred Battles country, while Yun Xiao ponders over how all the people died, considering their flesh wounds don't appear to be man-made. Noting that the messy wounds of the victims look like they were chewed up by beasts, the duo realizes that the culprits behind the act are monsters. Right then, the corpses begin to glow a green hue, and a buzzing sound rings out. Small parasitic bugs begin swarming out of the corpses' mouths, surrounding Ji Meng and Yun Xiao. Well, thanks for the trauma guys, being the first tier monsters, named Nasal Bugs. Each of the creatures is as powerful as a martial warrior. By mass reproducing in places where many corpses lay, they make up for their low power and numbers. Fortunately, a lot of them look like hatchlings at the moment, not possessing that much strength. Only a few old bugs are as strong as a peak martial warrior. Ji Meng frets over the monsters' numbers, getting told not to worry about the unintelligent and ugly bugs, deeming them as fun to kill. Yun Xiao swings his icy third-tier Shuan weapon with a dance-like motion, impressively taking down ten monsters in one strike, despite being a martial warrior himself. Dude is just himothy. Impressed by his master's prowess, Ji Meng refuses to fall behind. Stepping in front of Yun Xiao, he unleashes his Peach Blossom sword intent, ripping the nasal bugs to shreds. Not needing the protection, Yun Xiao instructs Ji Meng to just kill the monsters, albeit doing it in a non-flashy way to save his energy for later. Of course, Yun Xiao himself runs wild with the third-tier Shuan weapon. Moments later, the strongest nasal bug makes its appearance, possessing the power of the Two Forces realm. Turning towards the beast, Yun Xiao releases his Lotus Sword Song. In just a few seconds, he completely freezes the second-tier monster. Ji Meng jumps in, letting rip his Peach Blossom Sword, intent to slice the frozen nasal bug to bits. Yun Xiao claps at his trusty aide's sharp technique, remarking that he will break through in no time. Feeling glad to be able to learn from him, Ji Meng expresses gratitude to his master. Meanwhile, on Phoenix Mountain, the enemy forces belonging to the Dust Flame Empire gather under an array. Firstly, the High Palace Deputy and Palace Lord, the Six Directions Realm Marshal Grandmaster named Qi Nun Zi. The rest are the High Palace Hexagrams, the bewitching duo of Five Elements Realm Marshal Kings, Sun Shi Yumei and Li Wan Shi. Ada Wai the Kinda. Fourth tier refiner Hu Yan Ming. Another five elements realm, Martial King Song Chung Tian. And the four star martial lord Xu Ping Hong. Finally, the man who injured Shi Ya Ching Wang and Chun Da Sheng. The five elements realm, Martial King by the name of Yi Shi Yao Shan. All these mighty foes take the stage at Phoenix Mountain. The array, marked with the symbol of the true soul Phoenix, burns fiercely getting handled by Hu Yan Ming. Right then, Xu Ping Hong gets alerted by something, as a marble with the mark of a bug shatters in his hand. Upon Qi Zunzi's inquiry, he reveals that the nasal bugs at Soaring Phoenix Town have been killed. The old man gets intrigued by the arrival of Tian Shui's forces, while Sun Shi Yu may teases Ping Hong for his weakling bugs getting killed. Knowing that they can afford to be careless, the martial grandmaster orders one of them to personally take care of the matter. Xi, Yu Mei volunteers to go along with Wan Shi, but Ping Hong quickly starts heading on his beastly ride instead, announcing that he will go, as they were his nasal bugs. Yi Shi Yao Shan warns the four star martial lord that he would be no match against Shi Yao Ching Wang if he was the one who entered Soaring Phoenix Town, but Zhen Zi declares that the commander is no one to be afraid of. Moreover, as Ping Hong possesses the mystic cloud shaking thunder roar, he wouldn't lose to a martial king anyway. Still, the Martial Grandmaster assures Shi Yao Shan that they will send more people if things go wrong. Today on how to trigger a red flag. Shi Yu Mei then tells Shi Yao Shan, who has been at Hundred Battles Country for quite a few years now, that their master misses him. Feeling indebted to the King of Hundred Battles Country, the Martial King has spent the past decade advancing their ranks. Soon, his efforts will bear fruit in the upcoming ranking battles, leaving him with no regrets. After fulfilling his debt, Shi Yao Shan vows to return to the High Palace, focusing only on martial arts, disregarding all worldly matters. Emanating a threatening aura, Song Chung Tian remarks that he will feel lonely without having a good opponent like Shi Yao Shan to keep him company. Blood thinks he's the Vegeta to his Goku. Of course, the latter thinks this is BS as he hasn't been a suitable opponent for the eight-star martial king for a while. 
At the foot of the Phoenix Mountains, Ping Hong confronts Yun Xiao and Ji Meng. Expressing disappointment at his opponents, being a mere two-star martial lord and a nine-star martial warrior, the man labels them as trash, only to get interrupted and told that he doesn't have to introduce himself, not because they know him though, but because they don't want to. Ji Meng snickers at Yun Xiao's comment, while Ping Hong gets enraged and prepares to attack the sharp-tongued boy. Once again, he gets ignored, as Yun Xiao shows interest in the attack of the beast he is riding instead the mystic cloud-shaking thunder roar. The reincarnated soul thanks the heavens who have sent him a mystic thunder beast, right when he needed mystic thunder blood. Ordering Ji Meng to keep Ping Hong busy, Yun Xiao announces that he will face the beast. Hearing this, the foe starts laughing like a maniac, as even a docile fifth-tier demon beast is as strong as a martial king. A mere martial warrior stands no chance against the mystic cloud-shaking thunder roar of a bloodthirsty one. Of course, Ji Meng gives Ping Hong no time to finish his monologue and unseals his agile serpent to attack him, dodging the incoming strike. Ping Hong vows to get rid of Ji Meng, before moving on to Yun Xiao. A ferocious back-and-forth battle ensues, leaving the reincarnated soul with the fifth-tier demon beast. Yun Xiao lets out a mischievous grin, making the creature take a step back. The mystic beast begins charging up his thunder, but the boy continues to march towards it, treating the mighty monster as if it were a house pet. Yun Xiao sits down in front of it. All of a sudden, he starts singing a nursery rhyme-like tune to the fifth-tier demon beast, leaving it baffled. Making the creature barf with the cutesy poem, Yun Xiao suddenly mutters, Come, my precious. Rose trying to riz up a lion, unleashing his moon eye. The reincarnated soul transports the mythic beast into the monument of the world god, pulling in one of its three souls and seven spirits each. The creature roars out, charging at the boy with a raging thunder. Its claw seemingly tears Yun Xiao to shreds, but it's only his soul's shadow. Moments later, a gigantic projection of Yun Xiao encapsulates the entire monument of the world god. With a villainous smirk, the boy prepares to crush the fifth-tier demonic beast under his massive palm, leaving it trembling in fear and letting out whimpering howls. Meanwhile, Ping Hong's battle with Ji Meng riles up. The former is unable to understand, how a two-star martial lord like the latter is on equal footing with him. Not wanting to keep wasting his time with Ji Meng, Ping Hong calls for the mystic beast to eat Yun Xiao and come help him, only to get frozen in place at what he sees. The reincarnated soul is sitting on the lush grass, petting the small demon beast clinging onto him like a dog. Unable to process this, Ping Hong starts rambling like an idiot. He shouts out, questioning if this is still reality. Having invested his all into making the mystic cloud-shaking thunder-roaring beast his greatest trump card, the demon beast trainer continuously calls for it. Of course, the little guy ignores all of his commands and keeps playing with Yun Xiao like a puppy. To make matters worse, Ji Meng's agile serpent starts overpowering Ping Hong. He rages, hurling his thunder-shaking jade flash strike at the two-star martial lord. Twisting and turning, Ping Hong's thunderous chi zaps towards Ji Meng, who remains unfazed. Pulling back his agile serpent, Ji Meng swings it in a beautiful way to unleash his peach blossom sword and tent. The two-star martial lord's chi blooms into a majestic flower that faces Ping Han's thunder-shaking jade flash strike head-on, devouring it whole. Questioning how he has been beaten like this, the demon beast trainer calls for his trump card to save him, getting ignored yet again. Understanding that he will just die in vain there, Ping Hong starts running and hopes that the others can deal with them. However, Ji Meng isn't willing to let him go that easily. Closing his eyes, he remembers how Yu Xiao performed the Lotus Sword Song and tries to mimic his movements. Moments later, countless flowers bloom and surround Ping Hong. Devouring him whole, they leave the four-star martial lord literally calling for his uncle. Me, personally, I wouldn't take this level of disrespect. Sheathing his blade, Ji Meng observes his own strength and awe. Just a bit ago, he was a mere seven-star great martial master whose absolute goal was to one day become a martial lord. However, by following his young master Yun for just one month, Ji Meng has now broken through to six stars and become a three-star martial lord. Yun Xiao claps for him, complimenting his slash for resembling the full technique. Ji Meng turns around, becoming fearful of the mythic beast, standing behind the boy. He screams for Yun Xiao to be careful, only to get shocked upon finding out that his master 
has somehow befriended a fifth-tier demon beast. Later, Yun Shiyao rides his new pet, noting how much easier it will be to traverse the mountains now. Right then, a massive slash comes flying towards them from the forest, cutting up all the trees in its path. Jumping off the demon beast, Yun Shiyao instructs it to dodge the attack as well. As he lands back on the ground, two shadowy figures march towards him. Sun Shi Yumei and Li Wan Shi reveal themselves, questioning how their brother Shu not only lost to such lowly maggots, but also got his little lion tamed. Skill issue. Yu Xiao snarks back, wondering if they are also from the trashy sect that the lion tamer belonged to, thinking that the boy has a death wish. When she tells Shi Yumei to capture the beast, while he kills the two mice standing before them, they can finish off the mythic cloud shaking thunder beast later using his blood as a high-quality restorative to power up even more. Swooping around like a wild beast herself, Shi Yumei closes the distance between herself and the creature. The demon beast roars out, teeming with thunder, it leaps at the girl. Suddenly, Shi Yumei unleashes her decenium bane water ring and shouts out, Hold! The flowing water wraps around the mythic beast, seemingly trapping it in a bubble. Shi Yumei boasts about how easy it was to capture the mutt, only for it to shatter her decenium bane water ring. The thunderous outburst. Annoyed, the girl commands the fifth-tier demon beast to just stay put, and shoots a bubble of water at it. This time, the mythic beast is unable to break free, seductively informing the creature that its blood will be drank later. Shi Yumei tells it to stop struggling, as doing so will ruin its taste. Ji Meng, who is looking on at the scene, gets asked if he is done watching. Much to his dismay, a gigantic, goblin-like creature is marching towards him. What in the Discount Hulk is this? Even Yu Xiao is taken aback by one Shi's demonification, who tells the duo to worry about their own lives, instead of wasting time watching the mutt. Grave danger awaits, as the reincarnated soul realizes that taking on two martial kings at once is too difficult. Being approached by the demonic martial king, Yun Xiao realizes that they are in quite a pickle, and throws a strength and origin blasting pill to Ji Meng. Upon taking it, the martial lord will lose his ability to fight for some time after the battle. Ji Meng knows that it would put his young master Yun in grave danger, but he also understands that he can't afford to waste time thinking about these things. Consuming the pill, Ji Meng unseals his peach blossom sword and tent. Erupting with an immense chi, he leaps at the demonic one Shi. While Shi, you may tries to comprehend how a mere pill can give someone such an incredible temporary boost in power, Ji Meng's agile serpent slashes her partner. However, one she simply grins, prompting Yun Xiao to shout at his aid, instructing him to dodge. Reacting just in time, Ji Meng backflips out of harm's way. W style points. One she laughs, claiming that the martial lord's attacks can't even make him itch. Noting that the former has gotten bigger than before, the latter tries to find a way around his tough skin. One she then announces that relying on medicines has a limit. After all, even if they bring Ji Meng closer to being a martial king, they will never make him a real martial king. On the other hand, with his demonification, Wan Shi is a true three-star martial king. Charging up a ball of green energy above his mouth, the demonic foe unleashes his earth-devouring technique at Ji Meng. A flood-like wave of Qi hurls toward Ji Meng, scorching everything in its path. The martial lord attempts to block the attack, suffering grave injuries in the process. Right then, Yun Xiao taps Ji Meng on the shoulder, instructing him to retreat. Not only is the difference in power with their foes too great, but they have also got enough intel this time around to head back now. However, the massive toad-like demonic martial king refuses to let them run away. Man is one ugly duckling. With their path of escape blocked, Ji Meng asks Yun Xiao to use the technique he used previously to stimulate his potential. The reincarnated soul warms the martial lord, that he has already taken an origin blasting pill, so getting more stimulation will kill him. Ji Meng insists that they will end up dying either way, leaving this risk as their only hope. After a moment of silence, Yun Shi Yao brings out his golden needles. Using golden needle acupuncture, he makes sure to stimulate only half of Ji Meng's tendons, as even this much is still extremely dangerous. He instructs the martial lord to control his strength and not explode. Enveloped in a crimson aura, Ji Meng screams out, Veins pop out of his neck and face, as the Martial Lord breaks through to the Five Elements realm. Shi Yumei and Wan Shi look on in disbelief as the latter unleashes his Crimson Toad demonic technique at his foe. However, 
The Martial King's full power attack gets blocked by Ji Meng's Lotus Sword Song, leaving him baffled. This time, Wan Shi prepares to attack with 120% of his power, only to get snarked at by Ji Meng. Even with his bloodshot eyes, the Crimson Toad demonic technique clashes with the Lotus Sword Song, shattering Ji Meng's agile serpent to bits. Breaking the Martial Lord's Shuan weapon, Wan Shi pushes him back and announces that he can now die. However, Ji Meng lets out a maniacal grin. Holding the hilt of his broken sword, he calls out, Cherry blossoms, re-bloom. The broken shards of Ji Meng's agile serpent swirl around, gathering over the hilt. Wan Shi exclaims in disbelief as the martial lord unleashes 10,000 blooming blossoms at him. Countless shards of the agile serpent hurl towards the martial king, forcing him to use his crimson toad true body's block. Suddenly, Yun Shiyao shouts at Ji Meng to catch something, having thrown Li Yi's benumbing frost sword to him. Shi, Yu may questions why he has it, getting told that Li Yi gifted it to him. Yun Shiyao asks the girl if she has a problem with it, infuriating her with his tone. He continues to act smug, even telling the B word to shut her mouth, shouting out in anger. Shi Yu may warns the reckless boy that she will come over to kill him if he doesn't stop. Despite this, Yun Shiyao simply snarks at her, being aware of the fact that Shi Yumei's trapping arts will break if she dares to even move a muscle. Then, the mythic beast will tear her apart. The reincarnated soul then proceeds to mock Shi Yumei for her fake eyelashes, telling her to just be a good girl if she can't kill him. Due to who people think Giga Chad is, while Shi Yumei gets the ever living crap annoyed out of her, once she gets bombarded by Ji Meng wielding Li Yi's Shuan weapon, Yun Shiyao worries for him as the martial lord is currently burning up his lifespan in exchange for small bursts of power. Ignoring the side effects of his newfound powers, Ji Meng rages like a wild beast. Ferocious yet meticulous, he unleashes a barrage of sword strikes on Wan Shi, finally cutting through his thick skin. Unable to hold on any longer, the martial king screams at Shi Yue to help him, prompting her to run to his aid. As Ji Meng prepares to land the finishing blow, Shi Yue uses her water chi to block his attack and push him back. Understanding that the martial lord can't maintain his heightened state for long, Shi Yumei picks up one Shi and starts retreating, wanting to come back after reporting to their martial uncle. Right then, a monstrous roar echoes throughout the mountain. Free of its water prison, the fifth-tier demon beast crackles with an immense Chi, unleashing its mystic cloud-shaking thunder roar. As the attack starts catching up to the retreating martial kings, Shi Yumei seductively asks one Shi, if he loves her. The latter confirms that he does, though wonders why the former is asking at this time. Touching cheek with one she, she, you may announce that he can die for her to prove it, throwing him back towards the mythic cloud-shaking thunder roar. Certified woman moment, one she screams out in agony, getting completely scorched by the blast. As he falls to his knees, she, you may, comes running towards him with the blade in her hands. She pushes one she onto the ground, stabbing him right in the chest. Coughing out blood, the poor guy questions why she is doing such a thing. The crazed girl shouts at one she to look at himself, reminding him that he is just a massive toad now. Kicking down on his face, she questions how one she could let her suffer like that. In exchange for his warmth, she may gave him everything he needed to flaunt his power and charisma. Even the one she was weaker than Yi Shi Yao Shan and Song Chung Tian. He was still always the best in her heart. However, it wasn't enough for him. Chasing after strength to become stronger than the both of them, one she went to the land of monsters, returning as a good-for-nothing toad. I do not condone this behavior, but I understand. Shi Yumei erupts into tears, questioning if he ever thought how she felt all this time. Her husband, a toad, and the things that people say behind their backs. Thinking about all this makes Shi Yumei tremble and stomp down on one she even harder. Seeing him train in his toad-like appearance, her love for him vanished day by day until she only wanted to end his life. Today, one she is finally dead, making Shi Yumei burst out laughing like a maniac. Instantly turning over to Ji Meng with a killer gaze, she provokes him to come to her, if he wants to kill her. Shi Yumei then turns into a stream of water, dissipating into the air. Ji Meng and the demon beasts start chasing after her, only for Yun Shiya to stop them. Exhausting his adrenaline, the martial lord falls unconscious, the reincarnated soul grabs Ji Meng before he falls to the ground and feeds him a restorative pill. 
Yun Shi Yao puts Ji Meng on the mythic beast's back, ordering it to take him back to Eternal Peace City. As the mutt like lion worries for its master with bulging eyes, Yun Shi Yao pets it. He tells the mythic beast not to worry, promising to return soon. The two then head off their separate ways, marching towards the direction where the true soul phoenix and the monument of the world god flew. Yun Shi Yao refuses to give up on the spiritual treasure, even if a martial sovereign were to stand in his way. Qi Zunzi asks Puyan Ming the time it will take to activate the array, getting told that they will need around six more hours. Annoyed, the martial grandmaster reprimands the fourth tier refiner for not keeping his promises. Yan Ming reminds Zun Zi that he is deciphering an ancient seal left behind by a great power, a task he wouldn't have been able to accomplish even in 10,000 years if the seal hadn't been worn down over the years. As Zhang Ming explains that this speed is fast enough as is, Shi Yu Mei comes running there in tears, revealing that both Wan Shi and Ping Hong have been killed. Yi Shi Yao Shan wonders about the identity of the attackers, as even he would be a little afraid of Ping Hong's martial king class mystic cloud shaking thunder beast. At the same time, Song Chong Tian questions how martial kings like Shi Yu Mei and Wan Shi couldn't stop them. The girl's subsequent words baffle her allies even more, as she reveals that just two people did all this with one of them being a martial lord and the other a mere martial warrior. Moreover, the mystic cloud-shaking thunder beast was somehow tamed too. Not only that, but the martial warrior also used some mysterious technique to raise the martial lord's strength to the five elements realm instantly. He just had the power of god and anime on his side. Hearing this, Yan Ming gets intrigued. After all, only a great refiner with extremely strong soul power could have tamed a fifth-tier demon beast that already had a master. Furthermore, even as a fourth-tier refiner himself, Yan Ming has never heard of a technique capable enough of raising someone's ability by an entire major realm. Not being interested in all this, Zhen Zi instructs everyone to be alert, vowing to skin them alive if they make any mistakes in these last few hours. Noting that the martial lord got heavily injured during their battle, Shi Yu Mei thinks that the martial warrior and the beast wouldn't dare to climb the mountain now. However, Yan Ming disagrees, as their enemy has already arrived. Hiding behind the bushes, Yun Shi Yao bursts into a sweat upon seeing the martial grandmaster and the fourth tier refiner. As the boy wonders how the Hundred Battles country managed to get such strong forces, Zhen Zi shouts at him to come out if he doesn't want to die. Coming out with his hands above his head, Yun Shi Yao asks if he can now live, only to get instantly captivated by the Crimson Bird Divine Flames array. Having doubted that a mere martial warrior would chase her alone, Shi Yu Mei shouts at Sun Zi and confirms the body's identity. The martial grandmaster declares that Yun Shi Yao shouldn't have come up the mountain if he wanted to live, refusing to let him do so now. Still holding his hands above his head, Yun Shi Yao scolds Sun Zi for going back on his word. Dude is fluent in Japanese. As the old man prepares to send the sharp tongued boy to his grave, Yan Ming tells him to spare his life. The fourth tier refiner wants to ask Yun Shi Yao something, but Chun Zi insists that he shouldn't fool around. Yan Ming questions how a mighty martial grandmaster is afraid of a mere martial warrior, vowing to take responsibility if things go wrong. However, Chun Zi isn't willing to entertain him whatsoever. In the end, Yan Ming takes advantage of the fact that he is the only one there capable of deciphering the array, forcing Chun Zi to listen to him. Ordering Yun Shi Yao to get closer, Yan Ming questions if he recognizes the array, having seen the expression the boy had when he first came out. However, Yun Shi Yao feigns complete ignorance, making Yan Ming think that he truly isn't aware of it. After all, the only reason even the fourth tier refiner knows of the ancient array is because of the knowledge he obtained in the High Palace's library. Complimenting Yun Shi Yao for being a talented second tier refiner, at his age, Yan Ming asks about his master. Qi Zun Zi and Song Chung Tian become alerted by the boy's prowess, with the former wanting to kill off such a scary talent before he comes back to bite him in the future. At the same time, Yun Shi Yao announces his master to be the leader of Tian Shui's alchemist association, Shu Hun. Rose is certified capper. Hearing this, Yan Ming remarks that Yun Shi Yao is exponentially more talented than Shu Hun and will be held back by learning from him. Introducing himself as a fourth-tier refiner from the Dust Flame Empire, Yan Ming asks Yun Shi Yao to be his disciple, baffling his allies. The reincarnated soul gets just as surprised, albeit for an entirely different reason. 
Yun Xiao ends up feeling greatly disrespected, that a mere trashy fourth-tier refiner wants to take him as his disciple. Jun Zi tells Yan Ming that this isn't the time to scout a disciple, ordering him to focus on cracking the array. The fourth-tier refiner asks the taken aback Yun Xiao to just stand there and think about his proposal while he deals with the array. Watching him work, the reincarnated soul notes that Yan Ming's technique is crude, but effective. Despite being slow, he is making progress in unraveling the array that will soon signal the birth of a treasure. Moments later, the Crimson Bird Divine Flames array opens, and its markings start spinning around. With Yan Ming's command, the array fully unravels, revealing the true soul phoenix in all its magnificent glory. Or so the hundred battle countries' forces think, bloods are onto nothing. Of course, Yun Xiao knows that what they see now is a mere sliver of the phoenix consciousness. Soon, it will dissipate, unveiling the real treasure. Suddenly, the true soul phoenix starts flying towards them, worrying Qi Zun Zi greatly. Even the martial kings aren't able to handle the pressure of the ancient treasure and fall to their knees, barely holding himself together. Yun Xiao stands in front of them and confronts the true soul phoenix head-on, enveloping everyone atop the mountain. The flames seemingly devour them whole. Moments later, they find themselves surrounded by a fragment of the true soul phoenix consciousness. Everyone stands in awe as Yan Ming questions if they are inside the ancient creature's memories. Meanwhile, Yun Xiao realizes that just a piece of the treasure's consciousness is much stronger than his past life's consciousness as a ninth-tier refiner, thinking that there must be a reason for why they have been pulled by it. At the same time, the true soul phoenix starts materializing its consciousness. Soon, Yun Xiao and the others find themselves in the Tian Wu continent from ancient times, possessing origin qi, ten times higher than usual. As Zun Zi questions how they can leave this place, Yan Ming reveals that the treasure they are looking for should be inside the true soul phoenix consciousness. So, leaving is the opposite of what they should be thinking about. Yi Xiao Shan shouts at Yun Xiao for zoning out at such a time, instantly realizing that his reaction is completely justified. The reincarnated soul stands in awe of the ancient being's real form as the true soul phoenix appears in front of them in all its stupendous glory. Bro looks just like Marco from One Piece for real, Looking on at the blue fire emanating from the creature, Yun Xiao notes that the true soul phoenix burns with the true flame of life, the treasure that they are looking for. Legends say that the ancient true souls are existences that belong to the Ten Directions Divine Realm. Even ignoring the power of the true flame of life, the Ten Directions enlightenment found within the being is bound to make anyone go crazy. Suddenly, the true soul phoenix starts descending. As Zun Zi commands his forces to grab its flame before leaving, Yan Ming announces that they should decide how to split up the treasure. Everyone grows wary of the martial grandmaster, worrying that he will use his strength to hoard the flame by force. However, Zhen Zi assures them that everyone will get a treasure. On the other hand, the fourth tier refiner starts changing the true soul phoenix consciousness according to his will, as the one with the greatest soul power has the most power over the space. Hu Yan Ming declares himself to be the strongest person there. A manacle laugh rings out as an alchemist unleashes his powerful soul. Realizing that his soul power isn't something that they can match, the hundred battles country's martial kings stand down. Right then, Yun Xiao shouts at Yan Ming to stop. Having been around for tens of thousands of years, the true soul phoenix's realm of consciousness has deteriorated immensely. So, acting recklessly might cause it to collapse, killing everyone inside it. Hearing Yun Xiao's warning, Yan Ming stops manipulating the space and simply questions his allies if he is qualified to take two shares now. Understanding that they would need his power to leave the realm of consciousness, the martial kings are forced to comply with the fourth-tier refiner. Yan Ming then turns over to Yun Xiao, understanding that he isn't an ordinary second-tier refiner. The former asks the latter to reveal his real master, not believing that Xu Hun can raise such a disciple. Snarking back, the reincarnated soul wonders if Yan Ming wants to give him a share too. Of course, Zhen Zi would only give Yun Xiao in exchange for his life. Just like that, the true soul phoenix descends, sending massive shockwaves in all directions. As Yun Xiao starts walking towards it, Shi Yu may questions what he is doing. The boy declares that he is obviously collecting the true fire, prompting Zhen Zi to hurl a massive blast of qi at him. Of course, the former ninth-tier refiner remains unfazed and redirects the trajectory of the attack with a simple flick of his finger. 
While Zun Zi tries to process what's going on, Yu Xiao smugly grins, throwing the Martial Grandmaster's attack right back at him. The Martial Kings look on in disbelief and Yan Ming questions how a mere second-tier refiner can utilize the power of the Realm of Consciousness. Bro's just built different. Yun Xiao declares and if Yan Ming can do it, then so can he. Enraged by the boy's comparison, the fourth-tier refiner shames him for exposing his true strength too early and vows to kill him. Forming rumbling clouds above Yun Xiao's head, Yan Ming rains down a thousand thunderbolts to blow him up. Much to his dismay, the thunder completely avoids the reincarnated soul. Questioning who permitted him to rage a thunderstorm in his presence, Yu Xiao disperses the clouds, making Yan Ming cough out blood. Acknowledging that the boy's soul power is stronger than his own, the fourth tier refiner inquires about his identity, ignoring him completely. Yun Xiao celebrates being able to use his godly evolution technique inside the true soul phoenix consciousness. Brimming with power, the reincarnated soul smiles, not having felt this sensation in forever. Realizing that something is weird about Yun Xiao, Yan Ming tells everyone to attack at once. Zun Zi comes back as well, commanding the martial kings to use their strongest attacks without holding back. The martial grandmaster unleashes his profound viridescent divine thunder, while Song Chung Tian fires off his holy dagger of jade flames. Yi Xiao Shan lets loose his extreme frost true chi, and Shi Yu Mei attacks with her concealed rainstorm claw. All their attacks combine, forming a wild burst of energy. The multicolored chi flings toward Yun Xiao, but he simply smiles in response, remarking that it's been a while since he reunited with his good friend. The reincarnated soul holds out his hand, forming a blade in it. Moments later, Gu Fei Yang's transcendent Shuan weapon named Constellation Impaling Sword takes shape. Even if they are only in the realm of consciousness, Yun Xiao feels nostalgic at being able to see his beloved sword again. Standing his ground against the incoming attack, the reincarnated soul unleashes his mighty technique, Constellation Impaling Sword, Orderly Contempt. A gigantic, majestic dragon projects out of the transcendent Shuan weapon completely neutralizing the Hundred Battles Country's combination attack. The former Ninth Tier Refiner's all-out onslaught sends his foes flying, leaving his soul power almost completely exhausted. They tried so hard and got so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. However, Yu Shigao has no time to rest. Realizing that the realm is about to collapse, he rushes towards the blue flames of the true soul Phoenix. Even though the reincarnated soul doesn't know for sure whether he can subdue the true fire or not, he brings himself to touch the ancient being. Suddenly, the blue flames flare up and start burning Yun Xiao. Scorched by the true fire, the boy screams out in agony. Getting burned by the true flame of life, the martial sovereign vanquisher refuses to die in such a place, using the divine realm tablet's soul materialization. Yun Xiao attempts to save at least his soul from being incinerated by the true flame, as the boy laments that his body is completely scorched, a bright blue light appears in the skies. Much to Yun Xiao's dismay, the true soul phoenix has followed him, even inside the monument of the world god. Realizing that he can't even hide, the reincarnated soul regrets that his lucky second chance at life is going to get taken away like this. This time, nothing will be left of his soul, leaving him no chance of reincarnating again either. Just like that, the true soul phoenix descends right on top of Yun Xiao. Accepting his fate, the boy closes his eyes, only to open them again in the place where he died in his past life, the Tiandong Mountains. Wondering why his consciousness is still intact even after his death, Yun Xiao concludes that he must be in the Phoenix's memories. Whatever, mutters the boy, deciding to just follow the ancient being and look at the Tian Wu continent's past. Right then, the true soul Phoenix flies to the top of the mountain's peak. A huge hole appears in the clouds below, followed by the sound of a wild roar. A demonic beast erupts from the clouds, having an appearance similar to the being. Yun Xiao once saw in the murals in the Tiandong Mountains. Black Flame Disaster, that's what the ancient texts called the Demon Beast. It must have designed the nerd emoji after bro. Suddenly, Black Flame Disaster screams out, spreading raging bolts of dark chi in all directions. The true soul phoenix responds with its true flame of life, colliding with the Demon Beast's raging energy. A monstrous clash ensues, causing the two energies to burst open and mix. The resulting impact causes space itself to shatter, baffling Yun Xiao. As someone who was once capable of standing at the peak of the Tianwu continent, the reincarnated soul feels truly humbled. 
by the beast's display of power, realizing that it's the very difference between the heavens and earth. At the same time, Yun Xiao feels confused about the identity of the Black Flame disaster. A beast that could fight one-on-one -on -one against the true soul phoenix, but was it recorded in Tian Wu's texts? This baffles him. Just like that, the two ancient beasts engage in a battle of a lifetime, clashing with each other, for seven days and seven nights. In the end, both beings feel truly exhausted. Black Flame Disaster retreats first, going back into the hole that it came from. The shattered space that once represented the beast's battlefield recovers, after which the true soul phoenix starts heading back to where it came from. However, the ancient beast withers and wilts on the way back, soon meeting its demise. Having witnessed the true soul phoenix's memories firsthand, Yu Shi Yao wonders why it died, considering phoenixes can revive. Not knowing how his consciousness is still intact, without a body and soul, the boy questions what he should do now. Right then, the phoenix's true flame of life snaps him awake, back inside the Divine Realm tablet. However, the ancient beast's fire still swirls around Yun Shi Yao, quickly entering him. Through the openings in his body, wait, all openings, sus. Moments later, the reincarnated soul literally feels on cloud nine. With the mark of the true flame on his forehead, Yu Shi Yao's soul gets reconstructed. Not only does the boy break through to become a rank three alchemist, but he also feels no limit to his soul power anymore. Yu Shi Yao then attempts to contact the outside world, finding him back in the subspace of the true soul phoenix consciousness. His body fully reconstructs as well, having broken through to the level of the three star martial master. With this, Yu Shi Yao finally understands. The true flame of life wasn't trying to destroy him at all. Instead, it wanted him to be reborn anew. Even with the true flame of life directly absorbed in his soul, Yu Shi Yao understands that it is really hard to control and concludes that he will only be able to fully utilize its power after becoming a Peak Nine Heavens Martial Sovereign again. However, with the fire protecting his soul, Yu Shi Yao grins understanding that he is practically the true soul phoenix itself, while they are in its consciousness. Of course, the reincarnated soul soon returns to reality, having nothing to gain from the mountain anymore. He starts heading back only to get confronted by Zun Zi. The smug look on his face, Yun Shi Yao snarks at the severely injured martial grandmaster for trying to hurt him. At the same time, the latter realizes that the former has become a three-star martial master, refusing to let him go now. Yu Shi Yao confidently accepts the challenge, prompting Zun Zi to tremble in fear, promising the boy that the High Palace will shred him to pieces. Once he recovers, the Martial Brandmaster retreats. The others from the High Palace follow, except Shi Yume, who was the weakest among them and collapsed along with the realm, noting that it will take a year or two for the Hundred Battles country's forces to fully recover. Yu Shi Yao thinks that it's ample time for him to become strong enough to kill them. After all, his soul and body have undergone nirvana throughout heavens and earth, yet alone is the honored one type beat. Right then, the mystic cloud shaking thunder beast comes running there, accompanied by Xiao Ching Wang, Chen Da Sheng, and Luo Yun Shang. Seeing them, Yun Xiao feels glad that they managed to live through today's predicament. After Yun Shang confirms that the boy is okay, Da Sheng questions the whereabouts of the enemies. Promising to tell him when they get back to the camp, Yu Xiao reveals that the Hundred Battles Country's army will retreat in a few days. Suddenly, the realization hits the adults. Yu Xiao is somehow a three-star martial master now, as there's a gap of a whole major realm between the reincarnated soul's previous level and now, they are left questioning reality. This further solidifies for Yun Shan that Yu Xiao is Gu Fei Yang's disciple. After all, no one else could produce such disciples. At the same time, Yun Xiao declares that he just got lucky to advance like this, annoying the three adults even more, truly my humble king. Later, Da Sheng commands the 800,000 strong army to Shining Gold City, initiating a pincer attack that results in the Hundred Battles Country's sound defeat. Suffering major losses, the Hundred Battles Country's army returns to their land. On the other hand, Da Sheng's army enters Shining Gold City, joining up with the troops already there. Arriving at the city gates, they are welcomed by the Fei Long general himself, Li Chang Feng. Being the eldest son of the Li family in his current life, the former ninth tier refiner wonders how he can bring himself to call Chang Feng his father. Right then, the Fei Long general scolds his son for not saying a word, even though they are meeting after all this time. 
Yoon Xiao tries to calm down his daddy, only to find out that he has been worried for nothing, as Chang Feng enters the legendary Fei Long doting mode. Seeing the two bicker and banter, Da Sheng compliments Chang Feng for raising a good son. Of course, he has no idea what the Commander-in-Chief is talking about. Hun, Qian Fang, and Chun Lin start giving Chang Feng an earful, scolding him for hiding a son, as talented as Yun Xiao for all these years. Poor guy getting rolled for no reason. Once again, the Fei Long general doesn't know what they are talking about. His friends then inform him of Yun Xiao, being a second tier refiner and a three star martial master. Hearing this, Chang Feng is left in utter shock. Even while being unaware of Yun Xiao's advancement to a third tier refiner, he can't believe that his trash son who couldn't even cultivate before is now so competent. Tears well up in Chang Feng's eyes, prompting him to punch the ever-living crap out of Yun Xiao for tricking him all these years. After staying at Shining Gold City for three days, the army starts heading back to the capital, with their heads held high. Using illness as an excuse, Chang Feng distributes his duties to a few vice commanders and joins Da Sheng's army on the way back. During their journey, Jia Rong feeds Ji Meng some medicine that prevents his injuries from worsening. However, Yun Xiao worries that the martial lord is still in grave danger. As long as Ji Meng doesn't die though, the reincarnated soul is sure that he can heal him with his abilities, even if it will be a bit troublesome. A month goes by, and the army returns to the capital, shaking the royal court with their great victory. Of course, the matter didn't end with their triumph and only gave more fuel to the fire in the throne wars. Accompanied by Gao Feng, Qin Yang lemons were lying on the trash of the Hundred Battles country. Fortunately, that thing has succeeded for him. Feeling more confident than ever, the first prince declares that he will be waiting for Qin Yue, Li Yun Xiao, and Xiao Qing Wang there. After all, he wants to have first class tickets to witness their downfall. Outside Tian Shui's capital, a welcome platform is decorated to await the army's arrival. Traditionally, whenever an army returns from a great battle, the emperor leaves many nobles and officials, and personally welcoming them back. However, Qin Zheng didn't do so this time around, prompting Qin Yue to set up the welcome ceremony and platform instead. While the city guards worry about the consequences of their allegiance, Qin Yue gets informed that his father won't be attending today. With this, the second prince sits where the emperor usually would, declaring that he will be leading today's ceremony in place of his unwell father. Bro prayed for this, and it happened. All hail Prince Yue. These chants soon echo throughout the capital. After a while, Qin Yue stops them and asks his minister to note down the names of all the officials who didn't come to the ceremony today. He then asks Xu Yang the ETA on the army, deciding to wait there for the historic moment they arrive. Right then, Qin Yang arrives to spoil the ceremony, accompanying Qin Zheng and Qin Ru Shue. Everyone kneels before the emperor, except Chu Yang, as martial kings and above are excluded from doing so. Qin Yue gives way to his father, helping him to the throne. Meanwhile, Qin Ru Shuwen notes that she is only there to see Li Yun Xiao. Get in line, girl. Allowing his subjects to rise, Qin Zheng notes the army's flags waving in the distance. With the emperor's permission, Qin Yue starts the welcome ceremony. Sounds of trumpets and drums resound. As Da Sheng leads the army back to the capital, Yun Xiao's friends try to hype up the rewards that await him. After the throne wars, only to hear that he will be leaving Tian Shui once Qin Yue is crowned. Da Sheng marvels at the boy's ambitions, knowing that his name will be known throughout the world one day. Yu Shang vows to follow Yun Xiao wherever he goes, as it will get her closer to his master. Moments later, the emperor welcomes back Da Sheng's army, declaring today is not only a day where they win a war, but also one where the past will be behind them, paving way for the future. In other words, Qin Zheng will announce the heir to the throne. Drum roll time. Understanding that it will be hard for him to ascend. As the legitimate heir, if his father announces the eldest prince as the heir, Qin Yue tells him to wait. Qin Yang protests, but the second prince insists that he just wants to ask Qin Zheng three questions before the announcement. With an intimidating gaze, the emperor allows him to speak. Qin Yue first asks his father if the blade in his hands is sharp and if his army is mighty, getting his statements backed by the troops instead, a sign of rebellion against the throne. With such a blade and army, Qin Yue finally asks the most important question. Do I qualify to rule over the lands of Tian Shui? With a show of power, the battle for the throne reaches its rousing conclusion. 